Get ready for what is coming. The devil does not want you to see this message because he knows that his time is short. Many people are already sealed in his deception forever. It is no longer news that the earth has become a troubled place. What do you see when you turn on the TV or news app? It is always one trouble after another, one violent crisis after another. Wars, crimes, natural disasters, and man-made disasters are everywhere you look. It makes you wonder, where are we headed? But what if I told you that you already know the answer to that question? I am not going to sugarcoat it in any way. We and everyone on earth are headed towards the end of the world and to judgment. No matter how long you may have been hearing about God's judgment, one day, that day will come. And when it does, it will no longer be a question of whether it is true or not, but of whether you believed it enough to prepare for it or not. No one can escape God's judgment. No one can escape meeting their Maker when that great day comes. If you read the book of Revelation 20, 11 through 15, the Bible tells of the great white throne of judgment. This is the judgment for every person on earth, great or small, rich or poor, dead or alive. Before this judgment seat, the Bible says there will be two books. One of the books will have records of things each person did on earth, and the other book will be the book of life. This book of life will be the determining factor for who enters heaven and who gets thrown into the lake of fire. The Bible explicitly says that anyone whose name isn't in the book of life will be thrown into the fire. Hence, the only people who have a hope of passing the great white throne of judgment are those who received Jesus Christ and followed Him while they were on earth. In other words, only true children of God will pass the great white throne of judgment. Then, the Bible also talks about another kind of judgment seat as we read in 2 Corinthians 5.10. The Amplified Bible puts it this way, For we believers will be called to account and must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be repaid for what he has done in the body, whether good or bad, that is, each will be held responsible for his actions, purposes, goals, motives, the use or misuse of his time, opportunities, and abilities. And here is something you may not know, or maybe haven't given much thought to. But everyone that dies before Christ comes at the rapture will go to meet their own judgment. Thus, the Bible says in Hebrews 9.27, just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment. Why do you need to know this information? Because one day you will stand before God's judgment seat. What hope do you have that you will pass when God judges you? You see, like I said at the beginning of this video, everything happening in the world today is pointing towards a final point in our existence on Earth. Scientists and even philosophers have predicted that a day is drawing closer, that humanity will destroy itself with its inventions and evil intentions. Either that, or the Earth will no longer be inhabitable. You may have also noticed how many of the big hit movies have themes of a post-apocalyptic world where the civilizations of Earth are completely wiped out, with only a few survivors. These apocalyptic events range from climate change, an astronomical impact event, nuclear holocaust, resource depletion, epidemics, or even an alien invasion. Somehow, it seems the devil is preparing the minds of people in the world to get used to and embrace a lie that life on Earth would be okay and return to normal no matter what happens. You see, the difference between these fictional depictions and reality is that a day is truly coming which will change the whole course of history. This day will precede the final judgment of God on Earth. It is called the Rapture. You may not believe this, but the Rapture will be a cataclysmic event which surpasses any this world has ever witnessed. Scientists talk about the asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs and other prehistoric animals on Earth. The Bible also talks about the deluge, that is, the flood of Noah that wiped out every living being on Earth that wasn't in the ark. Now, before the final strike that will end all things in fire, as the Bible says, 
The rapture will be a world-changing event that will be accompanied by much destruction. Think about this. What do you think will happen to a plane whose pilot is a believer and gets caught up instantly while the plane is still in the air? What about vehicles that will be on the highway with passengers, doctors in the surgery theater, a crane operator lifting a large load above property and people, or a person cooking in their home? The list could go on. You see that there will be chaos all around the world in the same day. Millions upon millions of people will be missing without a trace. There will be riots, trauma, deaths, and many losses. But at the rapture, every true child of God will be taken up from the earth. We won't be here to witness all of these things. The Bible puts it this way in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. The world's systems do not know what to do with this. They won't turn to the Bible to confirm that the rapture has taken place. Rather, they will leap into action to cover it up with one lie after another to promote the agenda of the Antichrist, who will institute the one world government and bring everyone to put on the mark of the beast. They may call this a form of census or numbering system with benefits, and of course, many will go with it, sealing their fate for all eternity. I cannot tell you what will happen after the rapture takes place, except by speculation. I am more interested in telling you that, no matter what, you must not miss this event. The Lord Jesus has already told us of events that will lead to this great day when he will come for his saints. Matthew 24, 4-14 Jesus answered, Watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, claiming, I am the Messiah, and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. And you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false witnesses will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Aren't these things already being fulfilled before our very eyes today? Indeed, that great day of God's judgment is fast approaching. When it comes, no amount of money, fame, Instagram or TikTok followers, selfie likes, properties, or awards will save your soul. Only one thing will save you on that day, and your eternity will depend on that one question. Did you receive the Son and the life He offered? Your eternity truly will depend on your relationship with Jesus here on earth. I am not talking about your relationship with church. You may be going to church, and you should be going to church. But being a member of a church is not the criteria for escaping the judgment and destruction of the earth. Being born into a good Christian family, having a Christian name, or having a good moral upbringing won't save you either. Only one thing will save you. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Take note of those words. Whoever believes in the only Son, Jesus, shall not perish, but have eternal life. That is your access into God's kingdom, my friend. There is no other way. If there was, the Bible would tell us. Jesus already said He is the way, and no one can come to the Father except through Him. 
Dear Saint, as you listen to my voice right now, I want you to be encouraged and rejoice. The world is not your home. You may be feeling discouraged and alone right now, but do not give up the faith. Don't give up the fight against the darkness that is encroaching on this world today. Do not give in to their compromises. Instead, stay with Jesus. Stand in the truth of what God's Word says. There is a hope that no money can buy and no robber can steal. It is a hope that Christ has prepared a place for you in heaven. I haven't been to heaven yet, but with what I have read from the scriptures and those whom the Lord has blessed with visions of the kingdom, it is a place to look forward to. There you will have no more sorrows, tears, weaknesses, sicknesses, taxes, or fear. Everything will be wiped away. A brand new life, a fresh new start, and all the privilege of walking within the glory of God permanently for all eternity will be yours. If you are not saved, I invite you to a relationship with Jesus and ask him to forgive your sins and give you his eternal life. Invite him to come into your heart and take the seat of authority as Lord and Savior. Remember that only then do you receive the right to be a child of God, and only then will you receive the hope of eternal life. When our time on earth is finally done, this is the promise we hold on to as children of God, and it is a promise you must never let go of. Colossians 2, 17. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of his mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. In our spiritual journey as Christians, it's vital to acknowledge the unseen battle that rages around us. You see, there's a relentless adversary who wanders ceaselessly, yearning to lead us astray. Let's delve into the depths of this truth. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Stay awake, keep a clear mind. Your adversary, Satan, roams like a roaring lion, seeking someone to consume. Our spiritual foe, Satan, targets all humankind indiscriminately. He shows no favoritism, paying no mind to your faith, wealth, or moral character. His ultimate aim is to disrupt, deceive, and destroy. His strategies are multifaceted and intricate. He exploits any tool at his disposal. An astonishing fact is that Satan can even manipulate other people as instruments in his scheme to assault us. Another tactic of Satan is to infiltrate our thoughts to cause internal havoc. He's capable of exploiting your current circumstances to launch his attacks. He makes use of every loophole, every vulnerability against you. Satan is unceasingly on the offense, but he has a preferred target, Christians, those who have given their hearts to Christ and are committed to his teachings. These devoted followers are constantly under Satan's scrutiny. He's relentless in his pursuit to make them stumble. The Bible cautions us to stay vigilant, to remain alert, and to understand that our enemy is constantly waiting for an opportune moment to strike and bring ruin. This underscores the fact that while Satan's attacks are incessant, he holds certain moments as ideal for launching his spiritual onslaughts. These times often result in tangible repercussions in our physical lives. Therefore, it's imperative to maintain our spiritual defenses. Be prepared for the times when he will strike with full force. As the good book advises, if you think you are standing firm, be vigilant so you won't fall. It's critical not to fall into the trap of believing you can withstand Satan's assaults single-handedly. The enemy is always on the move, ceaselessly searching for the ideal moment to strike. This was made evident when God summoned his children and Satan also appeared. When asked where he had been, Satan declared to God that he had been roaming the earth back and forth. This conversation underlies the unyielding nature of our enemy and his perpetual quest to lead us away from our faith. As Christians, let's ensure we're mindful of these warning signs and stay firmly rooted in our faith, armed with the armor of God to withstand the enemy's attacks. Be alert, be prepared, 
Be strong in the Lord. This is the call to every believer. Reflecting on the story of Job found in the first chapter, we can discern an important message about spiritual vigilance. Like a prowling predator, the adversary does not rest, nor does he sleep. His objective is clear and unchanging, to wreak havoc in the lives of the faithful. It is possible that you found yourself lulled into spiritual slumber, seemingly unconcerned about matters of the spirit, or perhaps under the misapprehension that you possess the strength to counteract the devil's machinations single-handedly. Let me remind you, it is only through the divine power of Jesus Christ that we hope to resist such an adversary. It is a grave mistake to believe otherwise. It is unwise to wait until our families, marriages, careers, spiritual development, or prosperity come under siege before we rally our spiritual defenses. In the spiritual warfare we face, it is crucial to discern threats proactively and counter them with prayerful aggression. Just as God remains ever vigilant, watching over his children, the devil, too, is ceaselessly awake, biding his time to strike. We must be aware of the periods he is most likely to attack so that we may safeguard ourselves. The adversary often strikes following a profound spiritual experience seeking to trip up believers and pull them back into a life of sin. He yearns for their downfall, for their ruin. If you have recently undergone a significant spiritual transformation, be on guard. The enemy is likely plotting his next move against you. Understand this, any spiritual breakthrough you achieve is a direct threat to the enemy. He loathes your salvation. He seethes at your commitment to serve the Lord, and he despises your status as a child of God. Your spiritual victories are his defeats. Consider the biblical account of the Prince of Persia, who fiercely opposed the angel bearing the answer to Daniel's prayers. It is a poignant example of how the enemy reacts to spiritual progress. Take, for instance, the story of a man who started attending church. For a long time, he was a regular attendee, but wasn't truly saved. He attended Bible studies, learning the scriptures, and fought against his addictions to foster spiritual growth. One glorious day, he surrendered his life to Christ and chose to leave his past behind, stepping into a new life as a new creation. For each of us, let this serve as a sobering reminder. Spiritual vigilance is not optional, it's essential. The enemy is at work, seeking to undo our progress, yet, we can remain steadfast, armed with the power of Jesus Christ and the wisdom to discern the enemy's tactics. Stand firm, dear friends, and always be on guard. As followers of Christ, we must transcend the confines of the physical world. Not every event in our lives can be chalked up to mere coincidence. Many times, these instances are the manifestations of spiritual warfare. The true solution doesn't lie in the physical, but rather in engaging in spiritual combat. Think of the transformed man. He recognized the enemy's ploy for what it was. With resolute defiance, he rebuked the tempter. Many of us falter here, unable to repel the enemy's advances. The power to resist lies in our ability to say no. They are myriad ways we can assert this refusal. The Word of God is a powerful weapon to reject the enemy's attacks. Prayer is a fortress, a shield against the enemy's onslaught, and in the face of temptation, particularly sexual immorality. The Bible advises us in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Sometimes the wisest course of action is not to confront, but to remove ourselves from the situation entirely. Rest assured, there is no attack from the enemy that leaves us cornered without an escape route. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23 says, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. This assures us that our loving Father will never allow us to face a temptation too great for us to withstand. More so, He provides us with a way out in our time of trial, enabling us to persevere. Therefore, let's be vigilant, recognizing the signs of spiritual warfare. Let's stand firm, equipped with the Word of God, 
in the power of prayer, in the wisdom to remove ourselves from situations that may lead us into temptation. Remember, we are not left defenseless or without escape. We have the assurance of God's faithfulness. So let's be alert, discerning the warning signs, and courageously confront the spiritual battles we face in our Christian walk. The path of a believer is not without its challenges, and we must be vigilant. Remember, our God is ever faithful, always providing a path for our deliverance when trials come. Consider the time when Jesus, after his baptism, retreated to the wilderness for a period of spiritual contemplation, 40 days and 40 nights. It's natural to imagine that angels would have surrounded him, singing sweet hymns of encouragement. Surprisingly, it was not the celestial beings, but Satan who made his appearance first. This encounter carries a profound lesson for us. Following significant spiritual milestones in our lives, it's essential to be vigilant. The enemy often sees these moments as opportunities to test our faith. Whether it's after a baptism, a spiritual fast, or a transformative prayer experience, the adversary may try to shake our commitment. Now, you might have heard people saying, once you are baptized, the devil will flee, or after a lengthy fast, Satan will avoid you. But experience in scripture teaches otherwise. These are the times when we need to be most alert, ready to affirm the authenticity of our faith. Jesus was not exempt from temptation following his spiritual awakening, but he found a way out. He relied on the word of God as his shield, his truth. And so must we. We need to be prepared to counter the devil's attacks and show him the divine strength we possess, the godly authority that enables us to resist his traps. Another crucial moment to be alert is when we find ourselves physically alone. Yes, we know that God is omnipresent. He never abandons us. But there are moments when we are physically alone, and it's during these times that the enemy often strikes. He fills our minds with unnecessary thoughts, leading us astray. He strives to isolate us, to separate us from our Christian community, from those who provide spiritual support. We must remain vigilant and never allow ourselves to be cut off from the body of Christ. My dear friends, remember that being a Christian means being a spiritual soldier. It means standing firm in truth, being ready for the battles that come our way, and knowing when and how the enemy might strike. Let's remain vigilant. Let's remain faithful. And most importantly, let's continue to support one another as we walk this path of righteousness. God bless you all. Do you notice how those strong in faith, those who partake in fellowship regularly, often seem to have an aura of strength around them? That's the power of communal worship, of the gathering of the brethren. Yet, tragically, many have allowed themselves to be shackled by the enemy's deceit, causing them to withdraw from this vital communion. The scripture reminds us, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. It is not by chance that this guidance is given. The enemy, like a lion on the prowl, seeks to isolate us. When we're alone, the mind can wander. And it's in these moments of solitude that the battle against sins like lust and masturbation often intensify. In nature, we observe a similar pattern. Predators isolate their prey from the group before attacking, an uncanny reflection of the enemy's tactics. By pulling us away from our community, he attempts to weaken our defenses, but we must stand firm, my friends, refusing to be separated from the fellowship of believers. We also find wisdom in reflecting on the temptations of Christ in the wilderness, as recounted in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. Christ, led by the Spirit into the desert, was tested by the devil at a time of physical vulnerability after 40 days and nights of fasting. The enemy, always cunning, saw an opportunity to strike when Jesus was at his weakest. In our lives, we too experience moments of vulnerability, emotional, physical, and spiritual. Could be the heartbreak of a broken relationship, the strain of health issues, or the crushing weight of life's trials. These are the times the adversary is most likely to attack, aiming to exploit our pain and weakness. Dear friends, let's take heed of these warning signs. It is when we're physically vulnerable or emotionally stressed that we are most susceptible to the enemy's attacks. In times of solitude or when we distance ourselves from our spiritual community, we provide him with the perfect opportunity 
to strike. Remember, we have been forewarned, and forewarned is forearmed. In times of vulnerability, let us lean into our faith and our spiritual community even more. Stand firm in the faith. Resist the enemy, and he will flee from you. Be vigilant, be prayerful, and keep the faith. Let's support each other on this journey, for together we are stronger. Let our lives be a testament to our faith, a shining beacon for others to follow. Let our words and actions be impactful, sending ripples of positive change into the world around us. Stay blessed and vigilant, dear friends, for our journey is long, but with God, we will prevail. Thank you for joining me in this discussion today. Keep the faith, stand firm, and remember, you are never alone. God bless you. This is what the Bible in Revelation 12.12 12 has been saying all along. The verse reads, Therefore rejoice, you heavens and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury, because he knows that his time is short. This verse is very explicit, and it tells us why the world is the way it is today. Where this verse says, Woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you, we can establish that the devil is now on earth. But that's not the only thing it says. It also tells us that since he's been thrown down to earth, the devil's angry because his time is short. So he knows he has a short time before the end of the world when the Lord Jesus Christ will return to rescue his people once and for all and take them to be in heaven with him. You can also understand from these words that the time is not only short for the devil, but also short for us here on earth. Could this be the reason why the devil's more actively introducing different kinds of sin and evil into this world than has ever been seen before? I believe that it is the reason. Remember that this verse isn't talking about a future event. Yes, the book of Revelation is full of imagery, symbolism, and literal messages. And this verse is one with both a historical meaning and a prophetic warning. You see, it speaks of the war in heaven when Lucifer, also known as Satan, the dragon or the devil, along with all of his angels, fought against the other angels led by the archangel Michael. The angels of God defeated and cast out Satan and his own angels, who would later become demons out of heaven and down to earth. Now, having been cast out, Satan, knowing he can't defeat God, is out to cause chaos on the jewel of God's creation, humanity, and wreak havoc on earth. I remember watching a wildlife documentary some years ago. It was about a rhinoceros who was tranquilized, captured, and taken into a reserve to keep its species from poachers who were hunting them to extinction. By the calculations, these wildlife experts knew that they only had a short time before the rhino would wake up and hurt anyone it saw. And they were right. As soon as they settled it down and were scrambling to safety over fences, the rhino woke up and charged at the nearest expert who successfully evaded and shut the gate just as the rhino slammed into it. This is how the devil is operating now. Like an angry animal recently released, he's on a rampage across the earth, furiously seeking to destroy everything in his path. Thus, we see why Peter wrote in his letter to the saints, which includes us, in 1 Peter 5.8, Be alert and sober of mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Jesus also warned us in Matthew 26, 41, Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The devil is not a lion. Only Jesus is called the lion of the tribe of Judah in the Bible. However, the enemy, just like a lion, or like the rhino I talked about earlier, prowls the earth seeking revenge against God by leading souls astray from the truth. Apart from his time being short, the devil is also angry because he was once an angel of God who was cast out of heaven for rebellion and pride. And since then, he's been waging his own war against the Lord by deceiving the world and leading souls into destruction. The devil knows that God loves his creation, man, but he also knows that God will judge sin 
and anyone who turns away from God will end in damnation. This is why he came and brought deception to Adam and Eve by tempting them to eat the forbidden fruit, thus turning them against God and causing them to bring God's wrath on themselves. This is how sin was brought into the world, as the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 5.12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people, because all sinned. And this is why sin and evil are rampant all over the world today, regardless of race, background, or social status. The devil hopes to condemn everyone to eternal damnation through the evils, temptations, and weaknesses of the flesh. However, saints of God, you need not worry. Why? Because Jesus has already won the victory for our salvation on the cross of Calvary. You see, even though Revelation 12, 12 tells us where and why all the evils, abominations, and chaos in the world today are on the increase, we can find comfort in these words in 1 John 5, 4. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. As well as 1 John 4.4, 4, You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. The only people who should worry about the threat of the devil on earth are those who haven't come to Jesus and surrender yet. As long as the life of Christ is in you, you have a hope of victory over the deceptions and evils the devil will throw your way. Why? Because through your faith in Jesus and his finished work on the cross, you are now a partaker in his victory over the devil. As a believer, we take comfort in the fact that Jesus has already won the victory over sin and Satan. And through him, we have the power to resist the temptations and evils of this world. Let us therefore stand firm in faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Why? Because he's promised that those who hold on to him to the end will be rewarded for all eternity. Matthew 24, 13 But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. In other words, Jesus is our security. In these last days, this short time before God wraps everything up in history forever, there will be great troubles. These are not troubles caused by God, but troubles caused by the devil as a final act to lead many souls astray. The world will be engulfed in a great darkness, and believers will face enormous spiritual opposition and temptations to compromise their faith. But those who stand firm in their faith in Christ will be preserved and delivered. Don't lose your focus on Jesus, my friend. Remember, He's our security. He's our hope. There is no hope anywhere else but in Him. The Bible tells us that with Christ in us, we have hope of glory. This means that there's a whole eternity of shame and regret awaiting anyone who turns away from or lives their lives apart from Christ Jesus. When Jesus told the parable of the ten virgins, He called five of them wise and the other five foolish. Yes, they were all virgins, connoting purity, which is a symbol of the Christian faith. However, what made some wise and some foolish was that one group carried extra oil that would keep their fire burning, and the other didn't, and their lights went out before the arrival of the bridegroom. When they went out to get fresh oil and returned, they were too late, and the door was no longer open for them. In these last days, we need to ask God for more wisdom. The Bible tells us that wisdom helps us to redeem the time, to make the most of it so that we're not taken unaware. Who are the people the Bible calls wise people? The wise are not the ones who are just looking to see the signs of the Lord coming. They are not the ones who only call themselves believers. No, the wise are those who see the signs, but focus more on standing in the Lord than other things. You see, in these last times, many will fall asleep in the faith. Many more will be deceived and go after other things outside God. Yet you must decide to hold on to Jesus and stand on the word. Jesus told us that in the last days, many people will claim to be the Messiah. Some will come in the Lord's name and will deceive many. But as followers of the Lord, 
We must remember that our Lord already told us about this. We must never be tricked by them. Remember that Jesus said that on that day, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter his kingdom. He said only those who do the will of the Father will enter. We ought to live our lives like people who are ready for the Lord's return at any moment, waiting for him to fulfill his promise to us. Let us rejoice each time we think about this. Why? Because like a bride and groom longing to see each other on the day of their wedding, the saints will be united with the Lord forever when he comes for us. So keep your eyes on Jesus, dear friend. Keep seeking Jesus, knowing him, praying, and walking in his word. For us to survive, we must be filled with and led by his spirit. If the Lord's spirit lives in you, he will guide you in Christ Jesus, the way, the truth, and the light. Do everything in your power and with faith in God's power, not to miss heaven. It's the only place to be. There, you won't have to deal with those things we deal with every day on the earth. In heaven, there are true peace, true freedom, and limitless possibilities. Not for only a few years, but for all eternity. And then there's hell. Many people who didn't believe in heaven or hell only ended up finding out later. Hell's not a place you want to go. It's pain and sorrow and torment forever. Keep declaring your faith boldly and praying for the unsaved to turn back to the Lord. Focus all your time and energy on making Jesus your center. When you do this, the signs will be clearer. Your focus will be keener. And you can draw more and more grace from the Lord to remain standing until He comes and takes us to be with Him in heaven forever. Failure in our lives is often a result of trying to figure things out by ourselves. Until we learn that peace and safety are only assured when we let the Spirit of God guide us, we will continue to go from struggle to struggle and from disappointment to disappointment. Dear child of God, have you ever thought about God's intentions for your life? What does a parent want for their child? Every parent wants to see their children grow and become fine personalities, even greater than themselves in society. Every parent is proud each day they see their child hitting new milestones and making progress in their various fields of endeavors. Similarly, God derives pleasure when His children make progress and prosper too. Psalm 35, 27 says, May those who delight in my vindiction shout for joy and gladness. May they always say, The Lord be exalted, who delights in the well-being of His servant. In another Bible translation, it reads like this, But give great joy to all who wish me well. Let them shout with delight. Great is the Lord who enjoys helping his child. God delights in your well-being. He enjoys helping you. Maybe you're plagued with questions like, if so, then why didn't he come through for me the last time? But instead, he let things end in pain. If so, why am I still struggling? If he truly loves to help his children, then am I not his child because I haven't seen his help? Whatever your question may be, it is understandable when our minds are overwhelmed with doubts, disappointments, and despair because of life's challenges. The great prophet Jeremiah, who had a close relationship with God, also had such moments in his life. Jeremiah 14, 8 through 9. O hope of Israel, our savior in times of trouble, why are you as a stranger to us, as one passing through the land who is merely stopping for the night? Are you also baffled? Are you helpless to save us? O oh Lord, you are right here among us, and we carry your name. We are known as your people. O oh Lord, don't desert us now. Jeremiah also dealt with despair and self-pity for a while. These things made him think many things about God until the Lord spoke to him and told him not to think or talk that way, but to rather believe in, think, and say what was right about his faith in God. Jeremiah 15, 17 through 19. I have not joined the people in their merry feasts, 
I sit alone beneath the hand of God. I burst with the indignation at their sins. Yet you have failed me in my time of need. You have let them keep right on with all their persecutions. Will they never stop hurting me? Your help is as uncertain as a seasonal mountain brook, sometimes a flood, sometimes as dry as a bone. The Lord replied, Stop this foolishness and talk some sense. Only if you return to trusting me will I let you continue as my spokesman. You are to influence them, not let them influence you. The prophet was airing out his heart and pouring out his anguish and disappointments for the Lord. However, beyond everything, he was saying, the Lord who knows all things and knows what we truly need spoke to him to remove those worthless thoughts and words far from himself. Do you know why God told him to repent from such things and to trust him? It's because you are influenced more by whatever you open yourself to. If you open yourself to disappointments, despair, fear, shame, or anger at God, they will take root and soon turn you against God. And by turning against God, I don't mean outright denunciation of the faith, but a loss of trust where we then depend on everything other than God. This is how we fall into self-dependency. Many people have stopped going to church, stopped praying about things, and just decided to do it themselves. Now, they just practice their Christianity by themselves, praying and reading their Bible only as a religious observance. They do not pray and read the Bible because they want to know the Lord more or obey what His Word says, but they just want to stay in touch because they still love the things of God. However, they have cut themselves off from a life of faith. Why? Because they feel God is untrustworthy. God failed them when they needed Him the most. God is too slow or God interferes with their plans. Paul warned about such withdrawal from the assembling of the saints not just because we have to always be surrounded by saints, but because of what that isolation from our commitment to fellowship can do to us. Hebrews 10 verse 25. Not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. He further added in 1 Timothy 1 verse 19. Holding on to faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and so have suffered shipwreck with regard to the faith. Your faith has to be in place. If the enemy can successfully convince you to depend on your own understanding, he sets you up for a life of struggle with lifelong regrets. Things may not go the way you want. If truth be told, this is the way it is even when we trust in other things. The reason we are often okay to accept other things than God's is because we feel they are mostly tangible. But remember this, you're a child of faith. You were not born into God's family with tangible things which can be tampered with. You were not saved by something you could physically see, touch, or handle, but by the eternal blood of Jesus and the working of God's Spirit. 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 18 through 19. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. The Bible says that the just, the saved man or woman, shall live by faith. We walk by faith and not by sight. What do these words even mean? They mean that regardless of what you've been through, where you've been, and where you may be in life right now, your dependence must remain on the Lord and on His help alone. I once heard someone say, because of our human limitations, we only see a fragment of the bigger picture of God's plan and work in our lives. However, if we can trust the Lord for the bigger picture, regardless of the present view, then we can open ourselves up to a world of limitless possibilities. Don't try to figure your life out by yourself. You will never enter God's perfect plan or purpose for your life trying to figure things out all on your own. It's time to let the Spirit of God guide you. 
it's time to let the Holy Spirit help you. There is a reason He is called the Advocate, the Helper, and the Comforter. The Holy Spirit is not a lesser version of God. He is not a subordinate. He is not lesser in His deity. He is a confirmed part of the Trinity, just like the Father and the Son. He was present at the beginning and will still be present at the end. He is all we need to complete the Lord. When you receive Jesus, His Spirit, the Holy Spirit, comes to live in your heart. The Holy Spirit takes every transformative power of God and translates them into us. It is through the Spirit of God that we see and experience the possibilities of God. There are things on the earth that are not so life-changing in nature. You may not need to wait on the Lord to lead you to do those things. We call some of those things common sense. Some are taught in school and at home. Others we are taught by watching others. You see, we have a brain and a functioning mind for these things. These are things like brushing your teeth and bathing or like eating to quench your hunger. Resting after a fruitful day's work or planting seeds for a harvest. God gives everyone a natural ability to learn and do things without even having a relationship with Him. That's why we have geniuses and professional people who are very good at their craft and make a living teaching people how to excel at these natural things. However, no human can know the things of God by their natural mind. No individual can fathom the end from the beginning on the strength of their own mind. It just won't work. This is why you have geniuses and wealthy celebrities who are slaves to demons, sickness, failed marriages, frustrations, and depression. There are doctors and counselors who spent their lives educating and helping people learn to deal with these things, who are victims of the same sufferings themselves. These are not things the natural mind can figure out. However, when we let the Spirit of God guide and help us, life takes a new look. You will see light in darkness, hope in despair, strength in weakness, and peace in the storm. God said to Zechariah, chapter 4, 6 through 7. Then he said, This is God's message to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. You will succeed because of my spirit though you are few and weak. Therefore, no mountain, however high, can stand before Zerubbabel, for it will flatten out before him, and Zerubbabel will finish building his temple with mighty shouts of thanksgiving for God's mercy, declaring that all was done by grace alone. You are not going to overcome your current battles by your own power. You're not going to break free from that addiction by trying to figure out what it is. In fact, you may get caught even deeper the more you try to figure things out by yourself. However, when you let the Holy Spirit guide and help you, He will take you by the hand, level the mountains before you, and give you a testimony of His power. In these last days, where there are so much frustration, fear, uncertainty, hurt, and weariness, this is a message that will sustain you. I encourage you to take a moment to surrender that pressing issue in your life to the Lord. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you and guide you whichever way He deems fit. Replace your worries and frustrations with His peace. Cling to Him and cast off those unhealthy thoughts. Find your peace in your relationship with Him, knowing that you are loved. And because you are loved, He will preserve you and keep you if you will let Him. One of the unfortunate realities today of reading the Scriptures especially the Old Testament, is the unfamiliarity with ancient cultures, especially about worship of diverse deities. References to these cultures are often lost in translation, thereby leading most readers into having little to no understanding of some of the various pagan gods and mythologies of the nations of old, which ancient readers would have been very familiar with. Many biblical stories from the Old Testament describe some of these gods, their influence over those who worshiped them, and the complete superiority of the one true God, Jehovah, over them all. Among these gods of old, the most prominent ones, who at some points were even worshiped by the Israelites when they turned from the Lord, were the Canaanite deity, Baal, and the Philistine deity, Dagon. The word Baal means Lord. 
the plural is Baalim. Baal is the name of the supreme god worshipped in ancient Canaan and Phoenicia. Baal was a god of storms and fertility and was considered a very important deity in the Canaanite religion and culture. Due to his control over both the birth of children and the growth of crops, different regions worshipped Baal in different ways, and Baal proved to be a highly adaptable god. The practice of Baal worship infiltrated Jewish religious life during the time of the Judges and soon became widespread in Israel during the reign of Ahab and Jezebel. According to the Canaanite religion, Baal was the son of El, the chief god, and Asherah, the goddess of the sea. Baal was considered the most powerful of all gods, eclipsing El, who was seen as rather weak and ineffective. In various battles, Baal defeated Yom, the god of the sea, and Mot, the god of death in the underworld. Baal's sisters slash consorts were Ashtoreth, a fertility goddess associated with the stars, and Anath, a goddess of love and war. The Canaanites worshipped Baal as the sun god and as the storm god, and he was usually depicted holding a lightning bolt. He was seen as a god who defeated enemies, produced crops, and provided children. Baal worship was rooted in sensuality and involved ritualistic prostitution in the temples. At times, appeasing Baal required human sacrifice, usually the firstborn of the one making the sacrifice. The priests of Baal appealed to their god in rites of wild abandon, which included loud, ecstatic cries and self-inflicted injury, as seen when the prophet Elijah challenged them to a duel on Mount Carmel to see whose god was supreme. After Baal's prophets gave up because no answer was coming to prove his existence, Elijah prayed a simple prayer and God answered immediately with fire from heaven. The evidence was overwhelming and the people acknowledged the greatness of God. You see, most people do not know that when the Pharisees called Jesus Beelzebub, they were linking him to Baal. But God's word is proof that Jesus is Lord and the Lord God is supreme over all other deities. They are nothing more than demons masquerading as gods. Dagon served similar roles as Baal, as a god of fertility and vegetation. Starting in the book of Judges, there is a consistent thread of the Lord God Almighty being proclaimed as the one true God over Baal and Dagon that runs throughout the Deuteronomic history. Dagon was the chief deity of the Philistines, and the worship of this pagan god dates back to the third millennium BC. According to the ancient Philistine mythology, Dagon was the father of Baal, in contrast to the Canaanites El. Dag in Hebrew means fish. Hence, Dagon was the fish god, and he was represented as a half-man, half-fish creature. There are three places where Dagon is mentioned in the Bible. The first is in the book of Judges, in the story of Samson. When the Philistines had captured him through the deception of Delilah, a Philistine whom Samson had fallen in love with. The Philistines, believing that Dagon had delivered Samson into their hands, offered a great sacrifice to him. The second time he was mentioned is in 1 Samuel, where the true God of the Israelites completely humiliates Dagon in his temple. The third time he is mentioned is in 1 Chronicles, where the Bible records that the head of Saul, the king of Israel, was fastened. Just like Samson, the Israelites had fallen into the hands of the Philistines when the nations battled each other in 1 Samuel 5. And the Philistines, believing that their victory was the work of their god Dagon, brought the Ark of the Covenant into Dagon's temple and set it beside the idol. The next morning, there was Dagon, fallen on his face on the ground before the Ark of the Lord. They took Dagon and put him back in his place. They probably thought this was a mistake or an accident of some sort. But the following morning, when they came into their temple, there was Dagon again, fallen on his face on the ground before the Ark of the Lord. This time, the head and the hands of the statue of Dagon had been broken off and were lying on the threshold to the entrance of the temple. Only his body remained. 
The Bible records that from that day, no one entered Dagon's temple. God so dealt with the people until they had to return the ark back to the Israelites in fear of being consumed altogether with their God. 1 Samuel 5.7 When the people of Ashdod saw what was happening, they said, The ark of the God of Israel must not stay here with us, because his hand is heavy on us, and on Dagon, our God. The story of Gideon taking down the altar of Baal, the story of Samson taking down the Philistines in his last moments in the temple of their God, the story of Dagon's humiliation by God in his own temple, among many other instances recorded in the Bible, tell us more than we need to know about these deities in comparison to the living God. You see, from the days that the Israelites received the law of the Lord until Christ came, God forbade them from worshiping any idol or participating in any form of idolatry. Deuteronomy 6, 14 and 15 Do not follow other gods, the gods of the people around you. For the Lord your God who is among you is a jealous God, and His anger will burn against you, and He will destroy you from the face of the land. We saw God demonstrating His anger towards idolatry among His people for the first time when they made a golden statue with their gold earrings and bracelets and proclaimed the idol to be their God who brought them out of Egypt. Despite seeing the hand of God in their lives and on their behalf, they went on to give the glory that He alone deserved to a false God made with their own hands and resources given to them by God. They paid dearly with their lives. Even after entering the Promised Land, the Israelites would turn time and time again to other gods. And each time they did this, they'd become victims of war and slavery. This is significant to us as children of God today. Each time we give our worship to anything other than the Lord, we open ourselves up to the dominion of the devil. This is because although these gods are nothing compared to the Lord, and they cannot do anything by themselves, they actually represent demons posing as gods, so that they can turn the hearts of men from the Lord and take the glory due to God. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 10, 19-23, Do I mean then that food sacrificed to an idol is anything, or that an idol is anything? No, but the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God. And I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons, too. You cannot have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. Are we trying to arouse the Lord's jealousy? Are we stronger than He? I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. God may have called us to freedom, but we must not use that freedom to enter a new bondage with demons. The enemy only has one desire, to destroy the children of God. But when we turn to the Lord in repentance and devotion, He will save us. As we look at the Israelites, we can see that each time they turned to the Lord in repentance, He broke the chains of their captivity and destroyed their enemies. We saw this with Samson. Despite his poor choices and stubbornness, when he lost his strength and was blinded, he needed a guide and was assigned a young boy to walk with him. Imagine how the enemy reduced him from a mighty man who could take down thousands of Philistines at once to a blind man who needed a guide. But when they brought him out to ridicule him, Samson asked the little boy to take him to the pillars that held the building. There, he prayed for the Lord's mercy and for strength to take down the enemies. God answered him and gave him a victory that day that was more than all his victories in his lifetime. As we look at this scenario, we can learn how Samson had grown from an arrogant man to a humble one who admitted he needed help. This was the first time we saw Samson asking anyone else for help or asking the Lord for help. He had come a long way through his experience. Like Samson, the Israelites once took the blessings of God in their lives 
and turned them into an idol which led to their ruin. And in history, we have watched how people have made idols out of everything. Nature, money, the unknown, and every created thing. And the devil has always taken advantage of this to turn us against the Lord and take those blessings away from us by promising greater things. But David wrote in Psalm 113, 5 and 6, Who is like the Lord our God, the one who sits enthroned on high, who stoops down to look on the heavens and the earth? There is true freedom and peace in the Lord, and He invites us to a relationship with Him. No money, lust, pleasure, idol, person, job, or thing can ever make the kind of difference that a relationship with the Lord can make in your life. Today, God is breaking chains and setting people free. Just like He did in the past, when we call on Him, He is still showing up to humiliate any God in our lives and around us. And if we call and worship Him alone, He will rise up and do the same for us.